Please be seated. <clears throat> we also read, we're going to read from Luke 16 again, and I, I did mention um, this parable a little bit in the sermon last week, and and I, I know you remember everything I said perfectly last week. So, just, But the parable of dishonest manager is so confusing. It's one of the most confusing of all the Luke's parables, and maybe all the parables together. And the rich man and Lazarus is uh, so straightforward, so clear cut, but also very confusing. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. The poor man died and was carried away by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried in Hades, where he was being tormented, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side, and he called out, Father Abraham, have, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in agony in these flames. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your lifetime you received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner evil things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. Beside all this, between you and us, a great chasm has been fixed, so that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so, and no one can cross from there to us. He said, Then, Father, I beg you to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may warn them, so that they will not also come into this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. But he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. And he said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. That seems pretty clear cut. Seems pretty straightforward. You have two people who had drastically different situations in life. And when they die, those drastically different situations are reversed. And the one who had fortune in life has misfortune in death. And the one who had misfortune in life has great fortune in life. It seems perfectly straightforward and completely unfair. Completely unfair. Where the dishonest manager, we might struggle because of the twists and turns of the parable and the story and what Jesus is saying. I struggle. I struggle with all the things we don't know about this parable and all the people and all the, all the stories behind their lives and, and why it's so clear cut for God. Why it's so clear cut. But it does appear to be clear cut, at least in Luke. Jesus is very clear. The Beatitudes of Luke. Blessed are you who are poor, for you shall inherit the kingdom of heaven. It is uncomplicated. There are no qualifications. Blessed are you who are poor, for you shall inherit the kingdom of heaven. In Matthew, it's blessed are you who are poor in spirit. We tend to like that one a little bit more. Just in case, we might wonder, okay, well, the poor inherit the kingdom of heaven. But that doesn't mean the rich don't. Jesus has, in Luke, the woes. Right after the Beatitudes, he has the woes. Woe to you who are rich now, for you have received your comfort. Woe to you who have been well fed, for you will be hungry. Bam. No qualifications, no excuses, no backstory, just cause and effect. Poor will inherit, well-to-do, rich, well-fed, will suffer. And we have a, an infleshing of those beatitudes and woes here in this story today. The rich man is truly rich. He is dressed in purple clothes. He dines sumptuously. I heard recently that Catholic cardinals dress in red, even though they used to dress in purple, but purple got too expensive. Purple's expensive. Purple dyes expensive. It's why it's the color of royalty to prove status and wealth. This is a wealthy 
man. And he dines sumptuously. And at his gate, outside his door, he walks over the sore-ridden legs, the urine-soaked doorstep, the excrement. Can you imagine? Make it visual. The excrement of this very sick man who just wants crumbs from his table, who would just love a crumb. He knows the person is there. Indeed, he even knows his name, Lazarus, because when they're both dead and the rich man is tormented in Hades and he sees Lazarus dining with Abraham, he yells over and says, hey, Abraham, send Lazarus. No excuses, right? He knows him to dip his finger in some water. Just give me a drop. See the reversal? Lazarus just prayed or hoped for and wished just a crumb from the table, and now the rich man just wants a drop from the hand of Lazarus. Total, complete reversal of fortune. Abraham says, no, I can't, because in rich in life you were rich. And in life he was poor. I mean, he just re-speaks the beatitude and the woe, and he says, besides, there's a great chasm here. There's a great chasm, there's a big divide. In life, was there a divide between the rich man and Lazarus? Was there a great chasm? Was there maybe a, a high wall, something that kept, kept the rich man from helping Lazarus? What was there? What kept the rich man from helping Lazarus? Jesus seems to state that there will be something that will keep us from helping you after death. But is there something that keeps you from helping others in life? This is a good man, though. We know this is a good man. He says, I don't want this to happen to my brothers. He quickly accepts his situation, but he's got a heart. I don't want this to happen to my brothers. Please help my brothers. Send Lazarus to my brothers. Do they know Lazarus? It sounds like they might. They'll listen to a guy come back to life. He says, no, they got Moses and the prophets. It's already there. It's all out there. It's written on the wall. It's written on the page. They know it already. No, no, they don't know it. They're going to ignore it. Send Lazarus. They don't listen to Moses and the prophets. They won't listen to a man who'd come back to life. Lazarus appears twice. This is the only parable where someone is named, by the way. But Lazarus also appears in the Gospel of John. Mary and Martha's brother, who dies and Jesus calls back to life, probably was Lazarus. Lazarus was probably added to this parable. Added to this parable as a later addition in order to connect those two stories and the theme. Because when Lazarus and John comes back to life, you would think everyone would be like, oh my gosh, this is amazing, the Son of God. But actually, some saw it and got scared and walked away from Jesus. Seeing is not believing. Seeing is not believing. Why is it not obvious to the rich man what's going to happen? Should it be obvious to the rich man what's going to happen? This is what I want to have happen when the rich man dies. I want him to be able to give an accounting of himself. We don't know anything about his story. Maybe he was just a poor, poor shepherd, and he worked hard, and he saved, and he didn't script. He never squandered a dime, and he bought a share of sheep that grew into a share of fleece, that grew into a share of a textile mill, that then into a... Into a, into a purple dye factory, and he's maneuvered out all the competition, he's cornered the market to, to all, for all purple dyed robes east of Jericho. And he's worked hard, he, it's a rags to riches story. Doesn't it matter how you gain your wealth? And, and besides, doesn't it matter why Lazarus is poor? Maybe he's what the prodigal son in that story of the young man who took his father's inheritance and squandered it all away and grew to be starving in a famine in a far-off land, maybe, maybe his is the story, but he got too weak to actually make it home. Maybe his is the story of, of, of the opium addict who squandered away his life by bad choices, didn't take it seriously enough. Maybe his is the story where nine other people have helped him and nine other people have been abused and robbed by their good intentions towards him. We don't know anything about Lazarus. We don't know anything about the rich man. All we know is the rich man had an opportunity to help a poor man and a poor man suffered. That's all we know. And that bothers me. I want the facts. I want to know 
what else matters. There's the principles of the thing, right? There's principles. You're driving down the interstate, you pull off at an exit, and five times out of ten, what do you see to your left? Someone with a cardboard placard saying, hey, I need some money. What do you think? Well, I don't have any money. That's a good excuse. We have all sorts of kind of excuses, right? We have all sorts of kind of defenses. We want to defend ourselves. I want to defend myself. No one, almost no one, and certainly none of you, make any decision that you think is bad. Now, you might come to regret some of your decisions you make, but any moral decision you're going to try to justify in some way. I don't have any money. Justification. We don't know how he's going to use the money. Justification. He's probably going to waste it on alcohol. Justification. He's probably making 35 grand a year standing there. Justification. We're entitling him. Justification. If we give him money, we're going to keep him from um, seeking the social services that are in place in Knoxville that might actually help him. Justification. Right? We justify how we don't help immediately with money our neighbor. I mean, you might get to heaven. This, this rich man might have gotten to heaven and say, no, no, I go to synagogue every Friday night. I pay my taxes. I, I give my tithe to the synagogue. It's up to the synagogue leadership to choose how they want to use their money. I mean, I, I do what I need to do to be a good person. Maybe when we get to heaven and Jesus looks at us and says, man, you, you die with a pretty darn good bank account. I said, well, I pay my taxes. Maybe Jesus will buy it. I want to be able to justify myself. I want to offer excuses. And I'll use those excuses as bricks to build a wall between me and helping out those people who are around me. I'll use those ideas that I have. And they're not necessarily wrong. They're just maybe not all right at the same time to build a wall to keep me from really paying attention really entering into relationship, really helping the people who are at my gate. Who is at your gate? Who is at your doorstep? Who is in your life? Who is around you? Who do you see that you're walking around, that you've built a wall between you and them to protect yourself from their need? By excuse, or by principle. Deuteronomy chapter 15 has a, has, a, has a verse. It says, Do not be hard-hearted and tight-fisted to your neighbor in need. I like how it combines hard-hearted and tight-fisted. Ask yourself, I'm not a hard-hearted person, I'm a good person. Well, who do you give to? If you can't find people or, or things that you give to that actually serve the needy at your gate, then you might want to challenge whether you are or are not hard-hearted. If you always have an excuse about, no, I'm not going to give to this person, no, I'm not going to give to that cause, no, I'm not going to give to these needs, I'm not going to help these people, because, 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 then challenge yourself to whether you're actually a hard-hearted person or not. Because a hard-hearted person will not get into heaven, according to this text. It won't happen. Because that walls that we build with our because, 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 in the reversal, in the reversal where the poor are comforted and the rich will be hungry, becomes the chasm that cannot be crossed. What did Jesus do? Did Jesus have a lot of excuses for not helping people? I can't think of a story of Jesus where he put the principle of the, above the person. He's in Samaria, and there's a woman at a well, a Samaritan, and you're not supposed to talk to women. You're not supposed to talk to Samaritans, and he does. There are ten lepers. And he says, go. They call to him and they need help. They have mercy on me. And he sends them to the priest. Go show yourself to the priest. One returns. And he was a Samaritan. You're not supposed to heal Samaritans. And he does. He's at Simon the Pharisee's house. And he looks so intently at people that not only does he know what Simon's 
heart says, what Simon is thinking, that Jesus can't be a prophet if this woman, who's not supposed to touch him, this sinner woman, who's doubly not supposed to touch him, does. But Jesus isn't looking at who she is. He's looking at her. Your faith has saved you. I can't think of a single story where Jesus made an excuse for not helping someone. A leper comes to him out in the wilderness and bows before him. He's in the wilderness because he's not supposed to be in town. He says, Jesus, I know you can heal me if you want to. He's giving him an opportunity to walk away. He snorts, of course I want to. Of course I want to. No excuse. He sees the person. And that is his scripture. You don't need Moses in the Old Testament. You need the people before you. Are you looking at the people before you? He taught them, and he looked at them, and he had compassion on them because they were hungry. And he says, feed those people. And Peter tries to make an excuse. We don't have enough money. We don't have enough food. He says, fine, I'll do it. I see the people. And the people are speaking to me what God wants. Are you looking at the people or are you paying too much attention? Are we paying too much attention to the principles behind it? There's one really great story about this because Jesus almost lets me down. I almost couldn't use him as an illustration this morning. He's in Cana. He's in, he's, he's in um, the Canaanite lands and he's eating at a table. And a Syrophoenician woman comes to him and he, she says, Jesus, my daughter is sick or is she possessed? She's not well. I need your help. And Jesus, whether he's tired or frustrated or he's just in a bad spot or he's looking at the principle, he goes, wait a minute, I'm a Jewish man. I'm a Jewish prophet. I'm a Jewish rabbi. I'm a Jewish son of God. I've come to the Jewish people, not to the Syrophoenician people. It's not right, he says to give the food meant for the children to the dogs. Putting the principle above the person. And she says, yes, but even the dogs eat the crumbs from the table. And then Jesus sees her. And I think he either learns or he is reminded or he comes to himself and he says, your daughter as well. We are tempted to build walls between ourselves, barriers between ourselves that will become chasms between us and them, to not help people in need. But beware. Beware. God might not listen to our excuses. Listen to a word from God to you this morning.